just mathematically, if you'd extended the line, it does hit zero in 2045. Hello and welcome, this is Lockdown TV. Well, we like to tackle the big topics here and it's harder to think of a bigger topic than the future of the human race. Could it be that sperm count are to do with declining fertility rates? Well, Dr. Shanna H. Swan from Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York is joining us now to tell us about it. Hi, Dr. Swan. Happy to be here. So you have written a book and I'm just gonna read out its full title here because it's quite something. Countdown, how our modern world is threatening sperm counts, altering male and female reproductive development, and imperiling the future of the human race. Wow, that's quite something. Do you want to just give us a, a, an intro into what you've discovered? Well, what we found and published in 2017 was that sperm count had declined dramatically over the preceding 40 years and was at a point where um, nearly half of men would be entering that range of sperm count, which is associated with subfertility at least. And we didn't see any indication that the slope of that line had leveled off. So that when we looked at the data, restricting it to the past 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, you might hope that it would f be flattening out but we didn't see any indication of that, which is alarming because if it were to continue on its present course, well, that's a difficult thing to project, of course, but just mathematically, if you'd extended the line, it does hit zero in 2045. So that's the median sperm count. That means half of men would have no sperm. Not to, not to say that that is my prediction, I'm just saying that is the actual extension of the line. So just to kind of zoom out for a moment, we know that uh, fertility rates or the, the numbers of children that each person produces has been declining rapidly. It was around about five children per woman in the kind of 1960s, and that's come down to around 2.4, is that right? That's precisely right. And what's interesting is that that rate of decline is exactly or very close to the decline in sperm count. Now, of course, fertility is a function of both the man and the woman. And so um, if this is going at the same rate, it suggests that something is also in trouble on the female end because they're both contributing to this. And that's what we found, that a number of markers of reproductive function in men and women were deteriorating, if you will, uh, getting worse at the rate of about 1% per year. So I think what a lot of people listening to this will think as their first thought is, hang on a minute, we understand that numbers of children being produced are reducing, but who says that's got to do with sperm count? We know that lifestyles have changed, people have moved into cities, the economics have changed, fashions have changed. There are so many contributing factors, aren't there, why people don't have as big families as they used to. How can you separate out the biological from the sociological? You know, that's really, really difficult to do. And you're absolutely right that these other factors are certainly important. Um, and, um, you know, the ones you mentioned, they're matters of choice, deciding to delay childbearing, deciding to have fewer children, maybe deciding not to get married or not to have any children at all. That's certainly been increasing. But on the other hand, the sperm count and reproductive function does also play a role to couples who want to have children. And that's been difficult. The number of couples seeking assisted reproduction has been increasing. The, uh, there have been a increasing numbers of problems with those pregnancies. And men don't choose to have a low sperm count. So there definitely is an element of choice here, but it's certainly not the whole story. Do you have any sense, I mean, you've been studying this for a long time, what kind of percentage, what proportion of that reduction in the numbers of new babies being produced is down to biological factors versus all of these other sociological economic factors we talked about? I don't have a percent that I can give you, but I can say we know it. there's a substantial contribution from non 
choice <laughs> causes, if you want to put them that way. And um, those actually are things that happen to us or we're exposed to, which might be in part in our control and part not in our control. So things that are in our control are maybe whether we smoke or not, or how much we exercise, or what we eat, or and so on and so forth. And those things are definitely playing a role in fertility. Um, but then there's a lot of other exposures which we don't have control over, and those are much harder to get our hands around um, because they involve inadvertent exposure to chemicals in the environment of a particular kind. So the chemicals is, is the key factor which we really want to get into. But I just want to, just to establish the parameters here. Obviously, there are parts of the world where fertility is not decreasing or at least not so dramatically in places like sub-Saharan Africa, we still see populations increasing. Is that wrong? That is wrong. If you go to the data from the World Bank, which is an excellent accessible database, put in World Bank fertility data, you will see that sperm, sorry, number of children is declining everywhere. And in fact, the countries that start high, that start with a high number of children, are going down faster. So it is not true that these are not decreasing in countries like sub-Saharan Africa. Because quite often and we hear that it's a Western phenomenon. Certainly the populations are not being replaced in Europe, the parts of North America, Japan. It seems like these certain types of societies that are kind of late stage modernity are producing the fewest children. Is that true? That is correct. It is true that the being below replacement the value of 2.1 children per couple is um, more common in Western countries and actually, as you say, in Asian countries. That's where it's most severe. Um, the lowest point, I believe, has been reached of 1.0 children per couple, reached in Korea just recently. Um, <clears throat> but um, that's the rate of decline since 1960 of the most populous countries has been greatest. They are also declining, they're declining faster. So it's going on everywhere and um, it's a problem. And if you're right about the, the speed of the decline, it's potentially quite a major problem. It is a major problem, it is a major problem. And the, the question is, can countries recover when they get these very low fertility rates? And if you read the, What's coming out of, for example, uh, Singapore and Japan, those countries have been trying really hard, including giving economic incentives to get uh, couples to produce more children, and they cannot turn this around. And you even have strange phenomena in, for example, Japan having women marrying themselves and, and the celibacy syndrome and rent a family, which is a phenomenon in Japan. So you, you have these social changes which don't support family life. And, and it's very difficult to see how that's going to turn around once we get that low. What's strange is that one hears more often about population growth. You know, if it's just not even in recent decades, I would say centuries humans have been worried that there's going to be too many of us and we're not going to be able to feed ourselves. There's going to be immigration waves. It always seems like the specter is too many people. And you quite often hear that you're sort of doing your bit for the planet by having fewer children. You think the reverse is true then, that not enough population is our problem? I think that's going to be our problem. I think at this point, we probably still do have too many people, but that's going to change. There are, if people want to read about this, um, there's an excellent book called Empty Planet. Um, and uh, it, what, of course, we're talking about projection here, and this is difficult. And uh, you need models and you need, you know, demographers and economists who speculate. Uh, and so there are different models, but there are three well accepted models uh, from the UN, which is the low, medium, and high variant of growth. And under the low growth model, which many demographers now are getting to accept, we will reach a maximum, a plateau, if you will, in and the years vary, but let's say 2060 is something I've seen. And at that point, the population will decline and it will not recover. And that's what these demographers are saying. We have a, a problem we know is happening or a trend we know is happening, which is a reduction in 
fertility in terms of numbers of new humans. Sperm count is a component in that, you think. And let's talk about that then. How dramatic is the trend in terms of sperm count? The trend is extremely dramatic. It's been going on for a long time. Our study only went back to 1973. But way back in 1992, there was a study that said something quite similar, that sperm count was declining. Uh, it was declining at about the same rate as we saw, and it went all the way back to 1938. So this is a a decline that's been going on for quite a long time. Um, it really hasn't changed at all. And I've been studying this for 20 years. And remarkably, none of the things that you think might matter, like what kinds of men were in the studies or how sperm count was counted actually, uh, or whether they were more obese or more smokers, that none of that explained any of this because we looked at all those factors. And sperm count has been counted using the WHO standard in exactly the same way over this whole time period. So it's not a methodological issue. And you can certainly parse out who's in the study, and we've done that. And using similar men, similar methods, adjusting for things like obesity and age and smoking, it doesn't change, okay? So, so it is going down. And by the way, count going down is associated with other things going down, like how the sperm are shaped and how well they swim and what is their chromosomal, you know, damage and 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 all of these things um, are correlated. That means if those are going down, those other problems are going up. Give us a sense in numbers of what the trend has been. It's been a 59% decline in total sperm count over the 40 years of our study. And that's, that's global little... then? Is that taking from lots of different countries? No. no. that's a. It is taken from lots of different countries. It's taken from all the countries that we could find for this analysis. The problem is that these studies are not uniformly distributed around the globe or even by population, but um, certainly in Western countries, and that's the number I gave you, the 59% uh, in 40 years, that's, um, that's really solid and scary. In the book, you, you list out a lot of potential factors, a lot of things that might be reducing our sperm count, but it seems like the one you give most priority to and, and believe is the most salient is, is chemical. So there are these things called phthalates, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but which are chemicals used in the production of plastics that are now found everywhere and you believe are impacting sperm counts. Yes, and, and I, I talk a lot about phthalates in the book, Countdown, uh, because that's where a lot of my research has been. However, other researchers have looked at other chemicals and shown them also to be related to sperm count. But why did I pick phthalates? So phthalates are interesting because they have the ability to lower testosterone. They're called anti-androgens. They lower the androgens. Testosterone is one of those. And, and so um, if the pregnant woman is exposed to phthalates in early pregnancy, these phthalates can reduce fetal testosterone at a critical time for male genital sexual development. This was first shown in rodents, and it was so striking that it was named the phthalate syndrome. I see. So actually, what you're saying is that it's at the time when we are not even born that the damage is being done, not during our lifetime. Actually, it's both, but the se most severe damage is done before we're born. And why is that the most severe damage? Because changes that take place before we're born and particularly during the sensitive windows of most rapid development, um, those changes are irreversible. So here's a really nice, clear example. If a father is smoking before he conceives, and sperm are produced continually, so there's this window, 60 to 70 days, he's making sperm, they're going to produce this fertilized egg, if he's smoking, his son can have, on average, a 40% reduction in his own sperm count when he grows up. Okay, that's very big. If the mother smokes in the first, probably first half of pregnancy, um, her son will have the same reduction. However, if the man smokes as an adult, he also reduces his sperm count 
but by less, probably 20% on average. And if he stops smoking, he recovers his sperm. Could I just pause there for one minute? Because that seems like one factor that has definitely got better. I mean, women were smoking throughout pregnancy right into the 80s and have very suddenly stopped. And you won't find that many women who are smoking throughout pregnancy now. So presumably, the, our latest set of uh, young people are going to be at 40% better off sperm count than the people in previous decades. With respect to smoking, yes. So the fact that there has been this significant decline, despite the fact that smoking has gone down, places more of a burden on other exposures, such as the chemicals which affect the body's hormones. I told you phthalates affect androgens, the bisphenols, which make plastic hard, which line tin cans. They are estrogenic, which also affects reproductive function. There are other chemicals, or chemicals in pet. We showed in our study that men with higher levels of pesticides uh, in mid-Missouri had much poorer semen quality. Um, uh, other chemicals, such in flame retardants, in your Teflon pan, in, in, in lots of things in your home, your floor wall coverings and floor coverings uh, and your food food is a really major source and i don't know how much you want to go into the sources of these chemicals but you're absolutely right the fact that smoking has decreased in pregnancy is really you would expect something that would help sperm count and it would recover but it hasn't at all and therefore these other things which are increasing are playing a larger and larger role so you just listed out there the, these chemicals that affect our hormones uh, and therefore affect sperm count. You said they're in food, they're in Teflon, they're in the lining of tin cans, they're in pesticides. It sounds like they're basically everywhere. That's right. And that's why it's so difficult to study them. If we want to do a study of, say, smoking and sperm count, that's pretty easy. You ask somebody how much they smoke. If you want to do a study of phthalates or bisphenol A or PFOAs and sperm count, what do you do? You have to find out what's in the body. And to do that, you have to have biological samples. And <clears throat> if you want to find out what the mother was exposed to, you're going to have to have a prenatal woman's sample. And you see, it gets increasingly difficult to study that. So I, my study and with my group and many other studies in Europe and in the United States, at least, are doing that. They're recruiting pregnant women and asking them to provide urine and blood samples. And then they're measuring them for lots and lots of chemicals and, and making these links between those exposures and development in the child. And by the way, it's not just about the genitals and it's not even just about reproduction. This extends into neurodevelopmental changes, uh, immune function, and, and on and on. Pretty much any uh, output you want, outcome you want to think about is going to be linked to some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals because they govern our, our system. So I guess if I had a, a critique or a, a pushback, it would be having looked at the book that the list is so long. Uh, and in the absence of a sort of controlled study that says this cohort did, was not exposed to this chemical and this one was, and these, this is the, was the exact difference, it reads a little bit like a, just a long shopping list of potentially dangerous things that is so long you're almost not sure what you can do about it. That's certainly um, a reasonable criticism. And that's why I focus on specific classes of chemicals and study them in depth, one at a time so that we're not doing a laundry list. We decide ahead of time what we're going to study. We have a hypothesis. My hypothesis was that the phthalate syndrome, which had been seen in animals repeatedly and was indisputable in rodents, my hypothesis was that we would see that in humans. And I did several careful studies to do that to in totally different populations so I would have replication. And I found what I had hypothesized. And this is how you do science. You don't just take 100 chemicals and 100 outcomes and see what's associated with what. No, that's not good science. However, taking a well-formed hypothesis based on information about mechanism of action and the role 
of these chemicals in animals and what they do to animals and making sure you're using a good animal model for human outcomes, then looking at humans carefully um, and then replicating your results. That's why I can say that these chemicals are related at least to the genital development. Now we haven't talked about the link to sperm count and, and, and maybe you wanna go there, but these are also related to sperm count. And I showed that in our studies as well. One area that was controversial was the link between these chemicals or these environmental factors and intersex or gender fluidity issues. Um, you seem to make the connection that the, the lack of clarity between the genders and the increasing number of people who self-identify as neither fully feminine or fully masculine might actually have a chemical cause. Is, am I reading that correctly? Only in part. Um, I, that chapter in the book, and I'm so happy that you did read Countdown, um, uh, is, <clears throat> as you know, the most cautious. And the reason that I'm very cautious is that there's so much that we don't know. First of all, we don't know whether the prevalence of um, transitioning <clears throat> or gender fluidity, as we call it in the book, whether that has increased. The reason we don't know that is because we don't have prior data. So you can't really talk. We, it feels like there's an increase, but we don't have that data. So in the past, could have been there and co completely unrecognized and untalked about. What we do say is that disorders of sexual development, the actual alterations in the genitals, those are caused by environmental chemicals. And there's many examples of that in rodents, for sure. Um, and so it's reasonable, and fish, by the way, and frogs. <laughs> so many species have, uh, for example, ovaries and testicles in the same organism, right? And so there's no question that chemicals can change, a t you know, make these developments atypical. But what the animals would prefer, what gender they would choose if they could, how would we know that? It's fair to say by including a chapter of it in your book, which is about changes in sperm counts and fertility due to these chemicals and environmental factors, you are leading us to believe at least that there could very likely be a connection between them. I mean, do you believe that personally, that some of the gender issues we've seen in recent decades becoming more talked about are at least in part the result of biological changes due to chemicals. I know that hormone levels are intimately connected with these issues and 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 you know people who are going to transition they alter their hormones. Um, now if chemicals are doing this in an, products that are come into our daily lives it's possible certainly that some of that is going on. But whether this explains the rise, if there is a rise, uh, is, is unclear. What well, we put that chapter in the book because, first of all, it's very relevant, it's important, it's, and one of the things we're saying is that chemicals in the environment are causing changes of many, many kinds. And, and this is certainly, if it's causal, is a change. Another thing that they're doing is driving down testosterone. Well, perhaps that's making us less aggressive. Uh, there, uh, Stephen Pinker would think so, and 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 um, I think that's a hypothesis we have to consider. That you know these are changes that are brought about in part through man-made chemicals, and maybe we shouldn't give them all value judgments and say one is good and one is bad. It seems to me, from looking at the book, is that you are understandably very worried about this. You've devoted twenty years of your life to researching it. What do you think we can actually do about it? The, the list is, is long of potentially dangerous chemicals. We're not sure exactly which ones are most damaging of that list. Um, as you describe, they're pretty much everywhere in our households. If, if we're worried about this and want to do something to reduce it or prevent it, what can we actually do? So we 
spend a lot of time in the book, as you know, talking about things that people can do individually and as a society. And I'll just mention a few things. Um, so if a couple is wanting to conceive, hoping to conceive in the near future, then they could, in addition to cleaning up their lifestyles in ways that would also help their heart health, for example, and their general health, they could start thinking about minimizing their exposure to these chemicals in so far as they can, because they're mostly silent and unmarked. However, food is a really, really important source of exposure to many, if not all of these classes of chemicals. And so they come in way earlier than the food we see. They come in all the way back to, of course, the farming, the pesticides. Um, so if you can eat organic, if you can afford that, um, they come in the processing because chemicals that go through plastic tubing in production will pick up those phthalates. They are in the tin cans and they leave the lining of the cans and go into the products. But even if I go and spend a bit more money and buy organic food, it's still sometimes stored in plastic and tin receptacles, isn't it? I, I'm not sure. That's your choice. That's your choice. You could choose products that are stored in glass, and that's what I would recommend. And I would recommend that you not store them in your home in plastics, and certainly you do not heat them in plastics. Okay, heat and plastic is a really bad no-no. <laughs> and um, So if you're putting right. something in the microwave, you say don't put it in a plastic container, Take, pour it out onto the plate and then microwave it. Or put it in a glass jar or put it in a ceramic bowl or the, put it even in silicone, that's fine. But don't use plastic. So, it, so in, the, in the kitchen, we can catch a glimpse of behind you, uh, Dr. Swino. Is it a plastic-free zone? Um, not entirely, I have to admit, but I try. <laughs> yeah, okay. I do my best. And and then I, I think... Um, we have to take care of not having or trying to minimize the amount of fragrance. So fragrance is really a powerful, uh, if you will, source of, of, of phthalates and other chemicals that we would prefer to avoid. And um, we know this because we asked women what products did they use, were they fragranced, and then link those to the measurements of the chemicals we found in their bodies. So fragrance products should be avoided. Actually, phthalates are added to hold scent. They hold scent. They hold color. So lipstick and nail polish, they're going to be in there to hold the color. Face, you know, face creams, hand creams, they'll all have phthalates to increase absorption because they also do that. So they have lots of good properties, but we don't want to bring them into our bodies. So I, I would say check the products and there are a number of good sources online that you can go to to, to check an individual product. Um, and um, one is, I don't know whether you see this in in Great Britain, but there's Environmental Working Group in the United States, which is very good. And I'm sure you have other ones uh, there uh, that I can't recommend, but I would say seek out groups, concerned NGOs that want to provide you with information about the chemicals in the products you use. Uh, Dr. Shana Swan, thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. That was Dr. Shana H. Swan of the Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, uh, talking to us about various hormone changing chemicals that appear to be all around us and whether they may be behind the plummeting sperm count rates she has observed in her studies over recent decades. Thanks to her, and thanks for tuning in. This was Lockdown TV.